that they work well. However, the cross-link poly now has a proven track record of success. As far as the wear particles are concerned, the only thing they have uh, which they are trying to tackle is the shelf life, which is a problem. Because even, uh, but I think uh, there are a couple of things which are in offing and that will be taken care of. My next, my next lecture will be on the same game design. <laughs> you see, India, we, we Indians are better. We are in the middle of the path. I do cemented very well. I do uncemented the same way. So we are, I think Indians have got more variety in their mind and we can adjust according to the situation and according to the demands. So that's why we are better. We don't have, we are not very dogmatic. I will do only this. So that's where <laughs> we are we are survivors basically, so we keep on surviving. <coughs> I think, sir, uh, I, uh, regarding elbow arthroplasty, I do not know A B C D of elbow arthroplasty. <laughs> <laughs> I have just rotor surgery my whole life. So that that that's not good experience to talk about. And two of them I have perforated the elbow. We can discuss about the arthrofibrosis. Your comment, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, because of the time, uh, I think I ask more question. I would like to know about the uh, practice in India about the perioperative pain control after total knee arthroplasty. What will be the uh, panelist thinking? Okay, which multimodal perioperative pain management that you love most, including the type of anesthesia, type of uh, analgesia, including preemptive, intraoperative, and postoperative, which you share with us? I think uh, we can share our own methods. Like I, uh, I use one uh, drug which is given pre-op, that is a pregabalin. That's one. Per operatively, I inject my patients uh, with the marcaine, that's a long acting uh, anesthetist, and uh, butrum combination, but no steroids. My patients are operated under epidural anesthesia and uh, anesthesia, and post op for 48 hours, they are kept with epidural infusion or bolus as the need may be. And they are mobilized the same day evening with the exercises. They are allowed to take sides the same day. And next day they are allowed to stand and walk. So, but uh, the, I do use a nasal, uh, what you say, it's a centrally acting that butrum uh, nasal spray. And a uh, couple of patients, they, uh, I avoid using uh, sedatives, so I don't use Fortwin and Phenargans, the Pethidine or something like that. I don't want sedatives at all. And this is uh, most of the time, uh, is, is, I think even addition of pregabalin has made a lot of difference to my patient. Uh, I can tell you one thing, uh, rest all the same, but paraoperative uh, analgesia, I do two, two things. We g give cocktail and two cocktails. One is the deep and in the posterior capsule and all around the tissue that contains marcaine, morphine, normochloride, contramol uh, and uh, one is a superficial cocktail uh, that after uh, we in the subcutaneous plane we give marcaine and, and the normal saline and I, I, I can tell you if you do this post-operative patient does SLR, no pain at all. For three days it works. Later on you can switch over to as Dr. Prasad said to the other modalities. There is one thing uh, what we have started using recently apart from continuous epidural and infiltration and those things, pregabalin. Uh, now the fentanyl patches are available. It, it, it works wonder because uh, it, one patch will work for three days. You just stick it there and it's very good uh, analgesia patient care. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even they have patches which can work for seven days but doses are high so we don't want to give that. Uh, yeah, may I share with you my uh, research? Because I've published a paper comparing a femoral nerve block, continuous femoral nerve block for 72 hours with a cocktail using uh, ropifacane, uh, using uh, transcendalone, which is a kind of steroid, normal saline adrenaline, 
this mixture. And then we compare the uh, clinical outcome. The primary clinical outcome is the uh, total morphine consumption after the surgery within the three days. We did not identify any significant difference. Yes, because in the past, in my hospital, the anesthetist did a very good job. They can uh, do a very good femoral nerve block with the catheter insertion. However, due to the increase in the number of surgery that we require, in fact, uh, sometimes they are not effective enough, and then we take them over. And then we give cocktail in the past uh, few, uh, since uh, 2008, in the past five years. We identify very good uh, pain control, as the speakers mentioned. So I agree totally that cocktail is now the uh, mainstream okay, for the peroperative pain management. But still, I, I, I still identify some patients uh, develop nausea and vomiting in the early postoperative period, which is uh, very troublesome to our rehabilitation. Uh, sometimes it's related to the anesthesia, I would say. It's because uh, general anesthesia, I think, is quite notorious to have a uh, high incidence of nausea. And some of my anesthetist friends told me that they have uh, newer agents that can uh, reduce the, uh, 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 the nausea and vomiting. And this can improve a lot because after the operation, we still require to give DVT prophylaxis. And sometimes you may give an injection. I love to give uh, oral agents because uh, I would like the patient to be discharged early, okay, rather than stay in the hospital for too long. That's why we are, we are moving to the way that we are similar. No morphine, okay, better analgesia, less nausea. I'm a bit concerned about pregabalin because pregabalin to me, it is a bit more nausea, causing nausea. That's why we would like to use other analgesic agents. For example, we just use very simple because uh, I work in a public hospital. Patients do not need to pay, but they also cannot pay for those uh, patient pay items, including like COX-2, like pregabalin, and unless we pay by our department, but our department will bankrupt very soon. That's why we can't do it. And uh, we give a Panadol, one gram, and then continuous after the operation. This is a preemptive, because uh, very interestingly, according to the anesthetist, there's no good randomized controlled trial using preemptive analgesia, comparing COX-2 or other agents. I asked them why is that so. They said, if you are going to do this study, 99% you'll have negative result and you have no more pharmaceutical company as friends with you. So you better do not start this research. This is my comment. <laughs> and even uh, femoral nerve block is known to cause quadriceps of weakness and it, it delays your rehabilitation also. That, that, that's a problem. Uh, I think we have good enough discussion in this session and we close this session now and we should really thank chairman they were game they allowed us to have an informal chat here thank you sir uh, may i invite now dr amit rastogi and dr sandeep kapoor to chair the next session Right, I think we go to the next session. And uh, may I know how many speakers there are here? <laughs> Dr. Yadav is here, I think. And Dr. Harish Bende, is he here? Not here. Dr. Dhan, also not here. And Dr. Charlie? So, uh, right, I think then we have... Uh, basically just one speaker. Okay. This one. Oh, you are in the, uh, all right, Dr. Devnath, yes, please. Uh, Dr. Devnath was a speaker in the previous session, but unfortunately could not deliver his talk. Huh. We were early. They are in different programs circulating around. <laughs> so, okay. I'm going by the time that is going. Right. Okay. But you are ready with the talk then? Yeah, yeah. It's ready there. Right. Can you come to that? So, Dr. Devnath will be speaking on uh, importance of radiolucent lines and total knee replacement. Yes, Sandeep, sir. 
So here we are to uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on this uh, important topic of radiolucent lines under the TKR because this is uh, uh, a problem that I noted during my years of training in UK and we had done a paper on this and found out about how important the radiolucent lines were under a total knee replacement. So what I would do, now I've come back to India for the last two and a half years and practicing in Calcutta. And uh, I do, along with my spine surgery, I do total knee, total knee replacements and revision knee replacements. So radiolucent lines is measured on plain x-rays, AP x-rays. And the interval between the cement and implant and adjacent bones caused by imperfect bone cuts or excessive micromotion leading to poor implant seat. So that causes in future a lot of issues. So why do RLL frequently appear under your T-wheel component? It is usually in the periphery and in the immediate post-operative phase you can see these uh, radiolucent lines. If you do a cross-section in histopathology, you'll be able to see the cement, how it incorporates or interdigitates with the bone whereas the tibial component has very little to do with the cement. So is this of any consequence? This is a question we ask. And why do we measure radiolucent lines? In the immediate phase, we have fixation compromise. So if your surface technique of surface cementing is not good, you may have immediate issues of fixation compromise. In the long term, you may have wear debris, ballooning osteolysis, and loosening of implants. Measuring of radius lines below 2 millimeter may not appear on conventional AP view x-rays if the tibial stem is tilted by 2.3 degrees and a component diameter is about 50 millimeter. This was shown by one of the studies way back in 1996 and radius lines below 2 millimeter are of little importance in immediate post-op phase. Here is a study which was done to know a comparative study in patients who had knee pain and who had moderate knee pain. And they found out the seven affected zones of tibial stress shielding according to the classification of evolved. And in this they found with the patient who had moderate knee pain, medial side had more stress as well as at the tip of the keel. So this was the American Knee Society scoring system developed by Bach et al., which has come into vogue, and it shows in AP view and lateral view, you have zones. So in the AP view, you have zone 1 and 2 in the medial side, and zone 3 and 4 in the lateral side, whereas the keel area is divided into 5, 6, and 7 zone. In the lateral view, you see the anterior and the posterior as 1 and 2, and the keel tip is around 3. So they found out the mean inter-observer reliability coefficient for the tibial side was 0.82. Since then, we have come to this conclusion that we, all the radius lines are being measured according to this plan in standard AP and lateral digital radiographs. So this is what it looks like. In the tibia, you can see the same zones. In the femur, Usually, femoral component has very little loosening or radiolucent lines, although they have divided that into seven zones on the lateral view. So, how does it show in the literature? Osteolysis in the cemented TKRs has been very low as compared to the uncemented total knee replacements. The radiolucent lines leading to an osteolite lesion was most commonly found anterior to the tibial stem, that is, on the lateral view followed by the medial tibial condyle on the AP view. Osteolysis and radiolucent lines were more common in patients with patellar resurfacing. And this is important to know that RLLs may prejudice the fixation of a surface cemented tibial implant and also may provide a portal of entry for the joint fluid and all its contents to be pumped in into the metafascial bone around the uncemented stem, leading to osteolysis and loosening. This is what it looks like in the cross-section 
with the prosthesis in there and the cement and cement spicules are interdigitating into the bone. So, cement mantle, the surface cementing technique should be such that it should reduce the effective joint space. The envelope of the joint should be reduced by preventing this joint fluid laden with polyethylene wear particles and soluble factors such as interleukins and cytokines, access to the tibial metafascial bone, thereby reducing the osteolysis in the future. So that's the importance of radiolucent lines. Now, what are the factors that's responsible for progressive radiolucent lines? Your implant design is very important, operative technique is important, the patient-related factors and presence of cement. So what we did, we did a study on the operative technique because we have different types of mixing of the cement. A single mix cement, somebody uses double mix cement. So this was the paper. It was a prospective study on consecutive radiographic analysis, 50 consecutive TKRs in 36 patients, and mean age of 72 years with single surgeon. Both components, when are fixed together or implanted in the single stage, it's called single mix, with a single mix of cement. Whereas a double mix, you have two different mixes and two-stage cementing takes place with the tibial component first, followed by the femoral component. So this was a study which suggested, this was the AP view scores for the single mix, which showed that zone four was the most common, and in the lateral, score, lateral side, we have zone one, the most common, the single mix. Whereas, in the same problem with the happens with this double mix, which happens to have zone one and zone four more commonly in the AP view, in the lateral view, we have zone one and zone two. So on comparison, we found a p-value of less than 0 0.05 in both AP and lateral view, uh, suggesting there is a difference in double mix versus single mix. So single mix is recommended. Here is a case, example of a single mix technique, whereas we found the radiolucent line did not progress. Whereas in this, this double mix, we found that uh, there was radiolucent lines more commonly in this area. And the, we've, we've, we've been following these patients up over the period of time, where the next paper will be coming out soon by my colleagues in UK. They are going to follow this up and see which has progressed over a period of time to have a revision surgery. So we recommended from that paper that single stage cementation is recommended for all total replacements. Here is a case uh, which is uh, causing me a lot of trouble now at the moment is this case was done, a Calcutta patient, a 60-year-old lady who had a knee replacement, both knee replaced actually, but six months later this knee replaced uh, in from Mumbai and it's an all-poly component. And you see there is a distinct bone cement interface, there is a radiolucent line. She had moderate pain after a month and she came to me to see her how she is doing I gave her physiotherapy after a few months she was pain free then she came back again saying that she's not able to climb stairs she's got a lot of problem walking it swells up so she's now seven eight months down the line this is four months post-op you can see the radius line the four month uh, zone as well as in the six month uh, x-ray you can see the osteolysis is increasing their radiolucent line is increasing and suggesting there is a process of osteolysis going on. We have done aspiration bone scans to confirm there is no infection. So henceforth, we come to a conclusion that this is certainly due to the progression of the radiolucent line. So my question to the audience is, when would you do the revision surgery in this case? What is the appropriate time? It's only eight months. February was operated, and this is eight months since. Alignment, I have done a long x-ray, which is showing there is a bit of a tilting about a degree or two in the middle side. That's coming to Varus, yeah. When? Question. Yeah, eight months, so within a year would do you? No. no. That's right. Thank you very much for this answer because I was looking for this answer when to do it. In literature, it suggests whenever there is a problem increasing progressive uh, radiolucency, 
and there is sign of osteolysis and the patient is symptomatic, you need to do, but the problem here is they're all poly component. To revise these components is a very difficult matter. So we have to do more cuts and maybe do long stamina. Would you leave the femoral component intact? Right. That's right. In this case, a total revision is advisable. That's what I'm thinking. Thank you. I show you a case which I did for 75 year old with a 35 degree valgus val val deformity. And you see the cementing technique here. You will not see a red lucid line in this, even though the, there is a long stem. So that's what a cementing technique is all about. So in summary, for red lucid line, it's a good surface cementing technique should be available as a skill to the surgeon. Radiolucent line in the immediate post-op phase, less than two millimeter is non-progressive. Because you do x-rays at six months, one year and two year, you would be able to follow the patient up. And if it is two millimeter or more, it needs further surveillance like this in this case. And early revision surgery if symptomatic patient with progressive RLLs and osteolysis. So that's the summary and thank you very much. change in the topic because this says contemporary yes, design in total yeah, yeah, change, change okay so we it's have two it's different it's types of programs <coughs> okay so it's basically contemporary designs in total hypatroplasty okay. dr yadav yeah contemporary design in it's total hypatroplasty okay. is very important total liver arthroplasty is more important than the total knee because it can be done at lower center it can be done by low volume surgeon what i feel to everybody should know the total liver arthroplasty <coughs> it is not true in the case this is uh, in the total knee arthroplasty is just reverse so what is new may not be due many things in the society these are uh, new this war may be good for few, but bad for the society at large. We all agree that world has become very comfortable because of innovation. But at the same time, innovation has brought corruption, controversies and calamities to the society by market forces to make the money. We welcome all these innovation from cycle to bus, bus to aeroplane. Uh, this is the statement of Professor Rothman. What do you think within 10 to 20 years, which technology has made real difference in orthoplasty? Almost none. In 20 years, we are almost same with little bit uh, difference in the bearing. And many technology, many designs came with towering claim and banks. They disappeared and banned. As I mentioned in the previous uh, session, survey in UK. Thousands of drugs, hundreds of implants, dozens of interventions. Uh, they are not useful even then they are in practice. And dozens of disease they are either created or hyped to make the drug and then make the money. And these forces are increasing like the polit in the politics in our society. One person can say this is very good design. Another say no, uh, uh, this is not good. So. It is the registry which always they never tells lie. So we have to follow the registry. So registry reporting, early failure and very high revisions of many newer design in total hip arthroplasty. And standard, that is you can draw the conclusion from the registry, standard either cemented or hybrid or uncemented. 
टोटल हिप आर्थो प्लास्टी दीज डिजाइन आर स्टिल दे आर गोल्ड स्टैंडर्ड सो वट इज द फिलोसफी बिहाइंड द चेंजेस इफ यू चेंज इन द जोमेट्री दैट परफॉर्म्स वेल फॉर वन फैक्टर दैट मे नॉट बी परफॉर्म फॉर एन अदर फैक्टर मे बी बैड फॉर एन अदर फैक्टर सो न्यू प्रोसेस इज मे बी वर्स दैन ओल्ड एंड इट इज ऑलमोस्ट कंसेंसस मेन प्रॉब्लम इन टोटल ऑफ आर्थो प्लास्टी इज द बियरिंग इशू एंड बिगेस्ट लिंक एंड फेल्योर इज पॉलीथिलीन सो मोस्ट ऑफ अवर रिसर्च इज गोइंग ऑन ओवर दिस एंड ड्यूरेबिलिटी ऑफ द ज्वाइंट दैट डिपेंड ऑन द पेशेंट फैक्टर सर्जन फैक्टर एंड लिटिल विथ डिजाइन रिलेटेड फैक्टर्स एज वेल बट एट द सेम टाइम ऑनेस्ट एफर्ट हैज बीन मेड टू इम्प्रूव द डिजाइन a group they are working to make the money another group they are really working hard to improve the design to restore near normal function near normal mobility activity and stability and it should be everlasting many designs came like this short span lot of uh, many types of short stem so many generation have come like in the surface arthroplasty i am speaking against the surface arthroplasty for last 7 year 2005 now it has been banned in us i gave my lecture around 2005 6 in ludhiana against the surface arthroplasty so this almost now everybody is switching to conventional stem this few surgeon they have switched to mid head resection or what i feel they will ultimately they will go to this this is the gold standard this is our fuser uh, with little bit change maybe there uh, now about the cemented stem cemented and uncemented both are equally good there is a no doubt there, there should not be any controversy both have proven long term result they are still gold standard cementing is art thing is that it is very easy to do uncemented stem uh, uncemented stem or uncemented total hip arthroplasty it is very easy but doing cemented arthroplasty whether it is, is stem or whether it is cup it is really a art you should master it and all these things they are required in the cemented thing and uh, these are the third generation cementic technique so this is the gold standard in the cemented the collar less double or triple tapered straight stem that is most commonly every company have this type of stem now few points about the cement uh, uh, like uh, is still the cemented cemented stem it is preferred in the elderly age group especially doors type 3 cylindrical where there is a cavity is uh, cylindrical and in low demand patient it has advantage of early you can allow weight bearing immediately and uh, early fixation immediate fixation is there disadvantage may be loose uh, late loosening and difficult revision especially removal of cement is really difficult and it takes little more surgical time now few points about the cementless stem they are preferred this is general consensus they are preferred in the younger patients in the more active patient and protected weight bearing is kept for 3 to 6 week it depend on the surgeon few surgeon they allow immediate second day weight bearing in selected patient you can do that and uh, it uh, probably it give better long term fixation and revision is easy if it is loose there are three types of uncemented stem like uh, this is distal fitting uh, fitting stem this is proximally fitting stem here and this is short stem this is also proximally fitting but short stem and there are uh, drawbacks of diaphyseal or distal fitting stem standard proximally fitting is standard length proximally fitting stem they are the still gold standard and short stem disappeared so now what is the uh, drawbacks of uh, distal fitting stem they are uh, fully coated and they take fixation over here so what happens they causes stress shielding here osteoporosis takes place in this region because uh, weight wearing takes place mostly over here so issue is stress shielding another issue is thigh pain because of their isthmus fitting and their removal is more difficult than the metaphyseal fitting stem and they are good for the revision surgery like solution stem from johnson johnson 
that is very good for the region you can come out from any situations now about the size like size stem i have already discussed and size of head so few things they are good when they are large so evolution of i have already mentioned so many generation have come and gone uh, about the short stem if you compare the short stem with the conventional stem on the basis of in regard of patient selection cost complication reproducibility bone preservation and functional result they are inferior these short stem they are inferior to the conventional stem except revision that is easy in the short stem because they are inherently unstable stem they do not properly integrate into the parent bone and they go into the varus it is lot of literature is there even if you place it in the proper direction centrally they have tendency to go varus so it is except one thing everything is uh, they are lacking regarding the head size the advent of new wearing that is lot of uh, revolution is going on in new wearing that uh, led to regular use of large diameter head because of new wearing they are very versatile and uh, large head diameter it has definitely few advantages it gives more stability range of motion uh, but uh, more volumetric wear that is less in the new newer wearing and head neck ratio should be more than 2 there are problem with the small head point contact wear and less range of motion as i mentioned earlier for me 36 mm is ideal this is the uh, research from the johnson johnson lab this table is showing you can achieve maximum 160 degree range of motion but from the 36 mm you can achieve around near normal 150 degree range of motion so there is a no point going beyond the 36 mm because there are problem with the 36 uh, above the, this problem uh, especially aseptic loosening on the acetabular side so i use 36 mm if cup size is like that even from the 36 mm you can achieve this mittal saab from the ferozabad you can without they are doing like that uh, few points about the bearing uh, main now research is focusing on the development of versatile bearing and metal on poly they are the most commonly used more than 50% surgeon as dr prashad told in the morning that is the bearing of uh, everybody's choice but the ceramic use of ceramic head they, that is increasing now we have very good versatile ceramic previously ceramic uh, were not of that good quality but delta ceramic that is very strong even if we put on the floor it will not break so i use ceramic head with highly cross link cup and metal and ma metal on metal this is almost gone disappeared lot of controversies all over the world so few points uh, we have time sir time yeah, have. so few points about the uh, metal uh, metal usually they are made of cobalt and chromium uh, cobalt provides hardness to the processes and chromium it provides uh, it prevents corrosion and wear and ceramic alumina like the, that is commonly used that has least wear but it is less strong zirconia it is strongest but uh, uh, bear more wear than the alumina so uh, now the cross link poly highly cross link poly they have as less as wear almost like ceramics so the highly cross link poly delta ceramic cobalt chrome and this alloy is the our future so there there are uh, these are the benefits and risk of wear various couplings i will not go into the detail or this is this coupling which i use so i as i told this is the era of highly cross link poly many ways to cross linking annealing x3 uh, what probably is better than other uh, method like remelting longevity vitamin e treated poly now about the few points about the cup usually most of the cuff they are either hemispherical or sometime they are broader at the periphery like psl cuff from the striker 
that is very good for the proteggio and soft when the acetabulum is soft it takes fixation over the periphery it is broader at the periphery but most of the cuff otherwise they are hemispherical but newer cuff they are very good they are costly but they are very good they have very good coating like uh, titanium or tantalum coating and they look like your trabecular bone if you take a cross section they look like a trabecular bone and in it gives very good initial fixation if initial fixation is the initial good fixation is there then it is guarantee of proper integration and early integration of the component into the body uh, i have already discussed about the cementing technique after the newer cementing technique this revision rate has almost gone down Th these were the previous revision rate this almost this is from the registry has gone down significantly and these are the flange curve pressurization here pressurization and uh, medullary fitting medullary plug uh, this retrograde filling all these things are very important and pressure lavage as well very important MIS has almost gone from the arthroplasty numbers they are decreasing I, I do not see anybody most of the surgeon they are not being difficult learning curve is there no advantage more major complication is seen computer navigation and uh, not much as used in the total knee arthroplasty costly more time consuming but uh, there are less chances of limb length discrepancy if you use navigation in the total hip arthroplasty this is tripolar i will not discuss a, a few points about the surface arthroplasty surface arthroplasty so i will it is now almost disappeared so i will not discuss time is already over so message is short stem surface arthroplasty has failed use of ceramic uh, and uh, hexa crossly cross linked uh, poly and, uh, and ceramic head coupling is increasing use of metal on mat uh, coupling is has gone down cement uncemented both have equally good result advent of new bearing has made possible use of LDS like 36 millimeter head and metaphysical stem is better than diphysical stem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I think uh, we'll have questions at the end, and this may be the end actually. Is uh, Dr. Harish Bende in the audience here? Dr. Bende is not here. Dr. Dhan, Dr. B.K. Dhan, also not here. And Dr. Charlie. So, uh, Dr. Charlie is here. He's coming. He's here. Excuse me. What's your name? Venukarwar. Ah. Please, from Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, I'm have to invite me to speak in this uh, IOA con. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the cup position for the ceramic liner. So we all know that most common cause of the failed total hip arthroplasty is from aseptic loosening. And the cause of aseptic loosening is totally from the polyethylene wear. We can see from many registry, like the Australian register, that the loosening and the lysis of the aseptic loosening of the uh, total hip cause is the first cause of revision, and also from Norwegian registry, and also from Swedish joint registry. So, what is the importance of the ceramic? The ceramic, they, uh, it has a good wear characteristic, and the wear particle stimulate less immune response, much less than the polyethylene wear particle. Because of this, it makes less osteolysis of the total hip replacement. And we can see from the UK literature that the use of ceramic on ceramic is increasing and this is the wear rate of the ceramic compared to the other, as we all know that it costs, <coughs> it wear less than any other bearing. So, there is an 
uh, question in my mind that it is a hard on hard bearing. It, ha it has a lower wear rate. Is the prosthesis position is more forgiving, and the cup positioning is po sensitive or not? Can we place the cup uh, not in the normal position? Can we place the cup uh, in the in the position that is that is uh, that is very extreme and it may cause wear or it may cause something or not. So I go to study about this. The concern about the ceramic on ceramic, we have three concerns. Three complication, three main complications of the ceramic on ceramic is the squeaking, the fracture and the wear. So I'm going to show you the study that concern all, all of this, all of this complication. First about the squeaking. The squeaking of if the first paper come from London Watt from JBJS 2000 and 2009. They study 149 ceramic on ceramic total hip arthroplasty, and they found that there are no correlation between squeaking and cup inclination or in antiversion cannot be identified. So in the first paper, they conclude that the cup position is not the cause of the squeaking in ceramic. But on the other hand, but the paper by Walter from Journal Arthroplasty 2007, he, he compared the match control study of the 17 squeaking ceramic on ceramic with the 17 non-squeaking ceramic on ceramic patient. They found that hip squeaking while walking is correlated with acetabular component. And acetabular component that has more antiversion have squeaking. So the first two paper is not go with uh, one, one another. So I see more. By the, the paper by Rothman in 2008, they correct nine, 999 ceramic on ceramic ceramic on ceramic total hip and found 28 squeaking. But there are no statistical significant difference in the cup inclination and version between two groups. So that is all the paper that concern about the squeaking of the ceramic on ceramic liner. So, and then we do search into how the ceramic squeak. That is a, that is a very classic paper from 2009 Frank Stinchfield Award concerning about the cause of hip squeaking. They used the hip, stimula hip simulator to evaluate the squeaking in several lo loading conditions. There are two conditions. First is that in the die bearing, and second is the when they put the lubrication with the bovine serum into the into this hip simulation, they found that in all the, the situation without the lubrication, the squeaking occur. So when they use the hip simulator, hip simulator, every hip simulator has squeak when there is no lubrication. But when they put the lubrication in that hip simulator, the squeaking has all gone. And the squeaking continue, uh, and squeak, the, the squeaking start again when they put the the serum out. So the second simulation, they put the hip simulator with the with the bovine serum with the lubrication. They found that no hips has produced the squeaking. But when they put the metal, some metal into that into the serum, it produced squeaking. So they conclude that, so they conclude that the squeaking occur when there is a disruption of the lubrication, especially when they have a third body inside the moving surface, it will cause the squeaking. So the conclusion for the squeaking is that no evidence support that the malpositioning can produce more squeaking. 
and the speaking is multifactorial. Anything that can produce the disruption of the lubrication make, make the ceramic squeak. The second aspect is the fracture. As you see in, uh, from this result of the ceramics, on ceramic from many other, you can see that in the certain type of the ceramic bearing cause more fracture rate than the other, especially the sandwich type. The sandwich type ceramic liner is the, the ceramic liner that has ceramic inside at the polyethylene and the metal shell cup. So in this type of ceramic liner, the ceramic is very thin and it causes the ceramic fracture more than the other more than the other uh, type of ceramic liner. So the conclusion for the fracture rate, the least factor of the fracture is the impingement. When you place the club more vertical and you have a smaller head, means the head at the neck ratio is very small. You can cause impingement of the neck to the, to the limb of the liner and it may cause the fracture. At the edge loading of the <coughs> of the neck to the uh, of the head to the to the limb of the liner may cause the fracture of the ceramic liner. And the sandwich liner is of course the main factor to cause the liner fracture. And the last thing is the eccentric liner position. When you pick the place the li ceramic liner into the cup that is not correctly, and it is eccentric. It definitely caused the fracture. I have the experience in this case of myself. There are two cases that, that caused the fracture by the eccentric placement of the ceramic liner. So now we come to see, uh, we see about the wear rate of the, of the ceramic liner. How do they wear more than normal? The first paper is to see whether the, the uh, inclination of the cup cause more wear rate or not. They compare the cup at 50, 55 and 65 degree and no micro separation and cup 55 and 65 degree with micro separation the result is that micro separation, whether you place the cup in which inclination is more than no micro separation. But the cup in 55 degree and 65 degree, the wear rate is the same. So you can see in this graph, in the in the cup with micro separation is the large block on the light side of both columns. You can see with the micro separation, it costs more wear rate. But in the no micro separation condition, there is a less wear rate. But when you compare both columns, you can see that whatever the cup is, 55 or 65 degree, the wear rate is nearly the same. So we see how the micro separation was created. The micro separation was created by the swing phase. There is a, a little bit subluxation of the head from the ceramic liner. And when the heel strike, and when heel strike, the limb of the cup is uh, loading by the head. And then in the stand phase, it relocated. So this mechanism make the stripe wear and make it increase more wear for the ceramic liner. So the conclusion for the wear is that cup mount position has no evidence to produce more wear in, in vitro, but they must have micro separation to produce more wear in the, in the uh, ceramic liner. So the last thing we're gonna we're gonna see that is the cup position has the effect on the survival chip of the total hip arthroplasty. There is one 
one study, it is the retrospective study, seeing in 525 heaps. It consists of ceramic on ceramic and metal on polyethylene, ethylene. And in, and in these two groups, they divide into three, sub, into three subgroup. The inclination less than 40 degrees, the inclination normal between 40 to 50 degrees, and the inclination more than 50 degrees. They found that the ceramic or ceramic liner has longer survivorship than the metal on polyethylene liner, but there is no difference among the three group among the three liner uh, among the three inclination of the cup. So this paper concludes that the inclination of the cup has no effect on the survivorship, but this paper has only five year follow up, so that must be see uh, more follow up than this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Charlie. Since we do not have Dr. Bhende and Dr. Dhawan here, and we had missed upon one of the speakers in the last session, so I would invite Dr. Venu. He'll be speaking on bearing surfaces, that is ceramic on ceramic. Okay. Dr. Venu. Thank you, Chairman. Um, friends, uh, I won't uh, repeat the uh, topics covered by my colleagues excellently covering uh, certain aspects of ceramic and ceramic. And again, this is not going to cover the knee part. We, we're just going to discuss about ceramic and ceramic uh, in hip arthroplasty. Just going back to the basic principles, when we do uh, a total hip replacement, the aims are to restore or if the biomechani biomechanics are already abnormal, to correct the hip biomechanics, to provide durable and a physiological fixation of the implant to restore the functional range of motion so that there is no impingement during functional range of motion that might result in dislocation or excessive wear to provide lasting bearing surfaces depending on the age and activity of the patient for that you not only need an ideal implant an ideal bearing surface specific to that particular patient for his activities and also an ideal technique so, if you look at the ideal, an ideal bearing which we are discussing about today, so it should be biocompatible, it should have adequate structural strength, and that also includes notch sensitivity. Some uh, materials are more, more notch sensitive than others. It should have low coefficient of friction. It, sh it should attract lubrication, and we'll see how it can happen. This surface characteristic of the uh, material should provide nice smooth surface and it should have generically low wear. And it should have high resistance to corrosion as we have seen in some metal on metal. And it is good to have different size options as we are increasingly aware of certain size range of hip articulation have better outcomes. So keeping that in mind, these are the different options available we my colleagues went through so I'm going to cover just the ceramic and ceramic and just for completion metal and ceramic is not considered as safe anymore right these are different list of uh, features of any bearing surface we would like to know but coming to the ceramic aspect there are two uh, chemical materials alumina and zirconia so both have almost similar uh, properties from day to day, but there is a bit of difference between these two in other aspects of those properties. So I would like to just emphasize on third body where the previous talks did not include. Well, if there is any harder particle, harder particle is something that is very scratchy uh, between 
the femoral head and acetabular components. And if the material of these two components is softer than the third body, then those, the surface of these implants uh, will wear out. And that, that leads to quite faster wear. Because ceramic is the hardest wearing available. So third body wear, unless that particle is itself is a ceramic one, is not such a big risk. Not as much as other bearing surfaces. The other thing I also mentioned about lubrication. This is a, quite a relevant thing. It's called wettability. So if a drop of fluid, whether it is serum or any, any fluid, if, if that falls on the surface of that particular material, it might leave this shape of the fluid. But if it is more flatter rather than round, then it can spread over a larger area. An example, diag diagrammatically, that one is this one, so it makes a certain type of angle. But in contrast, if you have a situation where the, f the, the fluid, the, the liquid makes much narrow angle, means it can spread over the material much greater. So ceramic is hydrophilic, so it attracts fluid, and the fluid spreads all over it. And that can potentially provide fluid film lubrication, which is the gold standard in any bearing surface we always aim for. And ceramic has that characteristic. And that definitely reduces wear. So if you look at the difference between albumin and zirconia, the, the uh, tribological characteristics of these two differ in these areas because of these features. Um, again, if the purity will come back to that. If the grain size of individual particle uh, is smaller, then the wear rate would be less and could be stronger as well. And again, surface finish, you can see the difference between alumina and zirconia. In terms of strength, compressive strength, in fact, the alumina is much stronger than zirconia. Um, whereas hardness, again, alumina is much strong, much harder than zirconia. Uh, uh, hardness more or less goes with where? So if, if it's harder, it, you can't scratch it. The fracture toughness, which is the overall, the total energy required to break that particular uh, part, is stronger in zirconia. So again, going through the history of development of ceramics, the first generation, uh, yes, it was in 1974, only alumina. Uh, the, the manufacturing process uh, led to larger grain size, and we clearly saw from previous uh, speaker's presentation that the fracture rate was high. And also, those were not available in all different sizes. And the second generation, well, the, the, the main change was that the impurity was reduced in that alumina. That improved fracture rate very slightly, but not, not significantly. But the third generation has seen massive improvement because of HIP, the, the hot isostatic pro pro pressing of the processing of the of the material. That led to much smaller grain size. Uh, and also they also realized that the ceramic is, has a notch sensitivity problem, so changed from um, uh, to laser marking. And also the quality control improved. They would do b burst tests of all ceramic hairs, and those that survive would be re released in the market. But still, uh, fracture fractures were seen, but not as much as before. So. Then the, the uh, zirconia part came. Well, uh, you know, alumina has some definitely better parts of the better properties of ceramic, whereas zirconia has some other uh, advantages. So combined together in, 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 the, in the fourth generation one, it's, it's amazing the way the engineers did it. So basically, you have still the same grain size alumina, but with zirconia particles in between. And if the fracture, likes to propagate, wherever zirconia is, it is almost like a, a shock absorbing structure. It, the, the, these particles absorb the shock so they won't let the fracture propagate. And in addition, they also included chromium and strontium oxides, these plates. Again, they are like shields. If the fracture tries to uh, propag propagate and that stops it and it spreads on either side. So it doesn't, it reduced the fracture propagation significantly because it, 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 these materials are not sensitive. And in addition, also introduced 
uh, they changed the processing of, of uh, the ceramic included because the zirconias crystals are very polymorphic. They, they, there is no control on, forming, on making these zirconic crystals. When they introduced nano yttria stabilized crystals, that led to more controlled um, crystal formation. And along with that, reduction in grain size massively increased the tribological properties of ceramic and ceramic. The wear properties improved massively. Uh, the burst strength improved. The fracture propagation reduced significantly. And the fracture toughness also increased. So these were all uh, in vivo studies. So as you saw earlier, the earlier studies showed uh, ceramic fracture. But more, with modern ceramics, that has come down. But still, this is a brittle material unlike a metal. So even if you bang a metal, it doesn't break that easily, whereas this one, if you bang hard, it can break potentially, but the risk is very small. And again, if you look at uh, the incidence of these fractures, it is very small. Uh, but one, one, one specific point regarding liner fractures is, you know, I think improper seating of the liner plays a role as well. It's absolutely important that uh, you check the full periphery of the cup and liner to make sure that it is properly seated. Um, and if there is slight elevation, it means there is point loading in there and it can lead to hoof stresses and fracture. So in this particular x-ray, it might look great, but if you look at that area, that area is already prominent. So that liner hadn't seated in properly and it resulted in fracture later. Of course, these perhaps could potentially reduce those risks, but it is yet